are on day two of Better News Daily, and we are going to be in the book of Amos, which if you're wondering why we're in the book of Amos, of all things, that's understandable. <laughs> uh, but here's the way that this works. Every day, we're going to be in a different book of the Bible, looking for something thought-provoking or encouraging or challenging to start our day with. And at the end of each of these short videos, I go onto my computer and I click an online randomizer that will take us to another book of the Bible that we haven't been to yet. So yesterday we were in Jeremiah and the randomizer took us to Amos. <laughs> and to be honest, when I saw Amos, I was like, great. <laughs> Definitely not the easiest book to pull a devotional thought from. I mean, have you read the book? <laughs> it's basically a prophecy against ancient Israel for their corruption and idolatry. And it's almost all doom and gloom. In fact, this is the book where the phrase, the day of the Lord, first appears, which is this uh, term that comes with all of this apocalyptic judgment language. I mean, come on, what on earth could this book offer to us today? <laughs> Challenge accepted. So to start, since Amos is likely not your favorite book of the Bible to revisit, I want to give a quick summary of what this book is all about, and then I want to zero in on one particular thing. So Amos was a prophet, but he wasn't a prophet by trade. Uh, he didn't do this his whole life. He was actually a shepherd who was called by God to deliver a particular message to uh, the people of Israel. And he lived at a time when the nation of Israel had actually split into two parts. There was the southern kingdom of Judah, and there was the northern kingdom of Israel. Amos lived in the southern kingdom, but he was called to go to Samaria, which was the capital city of the northern kingdom. So take all this into account, not only is Amos not a public speaker by profession or an experienced prophet, he's also delivering a really aggressive message as an outsider to an estranged sister nation. Definitely not the job most of us would want. And if you read through the book, at the start, it seems like God is angry with the nations. There are sections where it's judgments against Tyre and Moab and Edom. But by the time you get to chapter 2, God starts condemning the people of Israel and Judah. And he's ticked, especially with the northern kingdom of Israel. There is injustice and immorality and idolatry. There's these long lists of offenses in the book. And the book eventually, at the end, predicts the complete overthrow of the northern kingdom of Israel. The, the people there were going to be removed from their wealth and their luxury and taken into captivity. And this, of course, happens when Assyria comes in and takes the people of the northern kingdom into exile. And uh, this would actually happen about a generation after Amos comes and preaches this message. So, okay, that, that's pretty depressing, right? Um, you, you might be thinking in your head, why is God so angry? A and what could this book possibly offer us today? Let's start with the first question. Why is God so angry? I mean, where, where's the love and the mercy? This seems out of character for him. I mean, d just even read this verse near the start of the book. This is chapter three. You only... Speaking of the people of Israel, you only have I chosen of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all of your sins. What? Why? <laughs> if they're so special to God, why are they being punished? Well, remember what Israel was called to do. They weren't just God's favorites, and therefore they were blessed unconditionally because of that. They were chosen by God with a mission in mind. They would be blessed, yes, but so that they would be a blessing to the nations around them and a witness of what God's character was like. Problem was, that wasn't happening. <laughs> and especially during the time of Amos, this wasn't happening. The biggest issue that God calls out in this book is injustice. The poor and the vulnerable 
are being exploited while the rich and the powerful ignore this corruption because they're benefiting from it. Chapters three to six in Amos go into detail on this. And it's in this section about the injustices where God's words to Israel start to become applicable for us today. So watch this unfold. This is verse four of chapter five. This is what the Lord says to Israel. Seek me and live. But if you skip down just about 10 verses, we read this. Seek good, not evil, that you may live. Do you catch it in there? There's a parallelism here that's really significant. Seek me and live. And a few verses later, seek good and live. What God is getting at is that seeking him and seeking good go hand in hand. If your worship of him doesn't lead to justice and righteousness in your behavior, then it isn't true worship. And that's why God says this. This is probably the most famous chunk of verses from the book of Amos. I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs, I will not listen to the music of your harps. But let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. God says, stop the offerings and the programs and the music. I don't want any of that. I want justice. Now, why does the very God who commands these religious festivals and offerings now say that he hates these things? I mean, is he that emotionally unpredictable? No. See, all of these religious rituals are things that people do to show that they are committed to God. But God is saying, you clearly aren't committed to me if you're neglecting justice and righteousness. These things characterize my reign and rule. There's a really great Bible project video on the theme of justice in the Bible that I encourage you to watch. They do a really good job of in just five minutes summarizing where this theme appears in scripture and why it's so important to to God. In fact, I'll put a link to that video in the description of this video. I encourage you to check that out. Here's what I want to focus on today. What God is condemning in the book of Amos is hypocrisy. Pretending to be one thing on the outside when you're really something else on the inside. The word hypocrite is interesting. Jesus, as far as we know, is the first person to use this term in a negative way. It's actually not an inherently negative term. It comes from Greek drama. It's a word that means mask wearer. So an actor in Greek theater was a hypocrite because they were pretending to be one thing on the outside that they weren't underneath. God says in Amos, you're being hypocrites. You're pretending to be religious and worshipful towards me, but but your behavior is incompatible with that. Remember, seeking God and seeking good are linked. So if worshiping God and doing good go hand in hand, then if you claim to worship God, yet you aren't acting justly or righteously, then you're being a hypocrite. And God says he despises these kinds of worshipers. And let's be honest, so do we. We hate pretenders. We can't stand when people act one way in public and another way in private. They appear one way on social media and another way in person. One way at church and another way throughout the week. And God is still passionate about this very thing today because we, like Israel, are his representatives here on earth. Our lives should align with our allegiance to God. 
It's kind of like a clapperboard. Do you know what a clapperboard is? Um, I, I bet you've seen one, even if you don't know the name for it. Here's one. It, it's that thing that they always put in front of the camera before they call action on a scene. In Hollywood movies, the director will have an assistant put a clapperboard in front of the camera and make that clack noise when the cameras start rolling. Well, do you know, do you know why they do this? Part of it is to mark the take number, but the clapperboard also serves another function as well. You see, the audio and the video are recorded separately, and the editor has to later put them together on the computer. And that clack sound gives a marker for the editor to sync the audio and the video tracks later. In fact, I even do this when I'm filming these videos. I will clap my hands before I start filming so that I have something to sync up my microphone with the video that I'm shooting. This is a really important tool for filmmakers because if what you hear doesn't align with what you see people doing or saying on screen, it can be a really big distraction. I bring this up to say, I wish that there were clapperboards for Christians, don't you? <laughs> Something to make sure that what we say is in sync with what we, what we do. I know that I could use one of these. So what could the book of Amos possibly offer for us today? Here's the question I want you to chew on. Are you in sync? Are your words and your actions in sync? Is your seventh day in sync with the other six days in your week? Or maybe a more personal question, is the person you are on the outside the person you are on the inside? And a question for all of us as a church community, does our worship of Jesus overflow into our lives so that we also live and act like him as well? I want to thank you for tuning in to this episode of Better News Daily. Before we go, let's pull up that randomizer and see what book we will be going to next. Our book is Mark. Ah, an easier one. Yay, a gospel. Okay, so thank you for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel down below or like our Facebook page so you can get these in your feed every day to start your morning with a little bit of better news.